welcome to the ninth bootcamp today with Classy. So those who are joining us just today, I would recommend scrolling through the YouTube playlist and going through all the eight amazing sessions we have had in the past with Classic. Today we have with us Tomer Goldfin from Classic. Tomer is a theoretical physicist by training and holds a PhD in physics from Tel Aviv University. He used to work at as a postdoctoral researcher at Ecole Normal Superior and the Weizmann Institute of Science before joining Classic as a quantum algorithm researcher. And today he is with us to discuss Hamiltonian simulations on a quantum computer. Very exciting and over to you, Tamar. Thank you, thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, so indeed I will tell you about Hamiltonian simulation and how to implement it uh, in, in general, but in particular with classic. And uh, this is essentially my plan. I will start with some introduction and motivation, and then I will go uh, immediately to two different uh, a way to implement Hamiltonian dynamics, one with uh, product formulas and another one which is based on block encoding. And the take-home message will be uh, first that Hamiltonian simulation is a fundamental quantum primitive, and of course uh, the two practical ways to implement will also be a take-home message. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, essentially where everything started in uh, May uh, 1981. In, at MIT, there was a conference uh, which was called Physics of Computation. Uh, here is a photo of many of the participants. So you can see uh, many of our heroes. You can see uh, the physicist Freeman Dyson and John Wheeler. Uh, there are also the computer scientists, uh, Thomas Otofoli and Edward Fredkin. So they are sitting uh, right next to each other. And I also drew uh, the uh, the quantum gates named after them. So this is the Toffoli gate and the Fredkin gate. And uh, of course, you you had uh, Richard Feynman there. <clears throat> so in, in this in this uh, conference, Feynman gave a, a lecture uh, whose title was uh, "Simulating Physics with Computers." I I know that uh, the Wominium is also. Uh, not only about this, this course is not only about uh, this session is not only about uh, quantum, but also about AI. Uh, so I found this nice quote uh, from Feynman's lecture. Uh, he said, We never really understood how lousy our understanding of languages was, the theory of grammar, and all that stuff until we tried to make a computer which would be able to understand language. <clears throat> so, what Feynman was uh, 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 looking for, and he said it was it was pushed by Edward Fredkin, is to understand how to simulate physics with computers. And during his talk, he mentioned the idea that, can we do it with a new kind of a computer, a quantum computer? <clears throat> okay, so the first quote is an example of things that he mentioned that, that uh, computer science help us to advance. <clears throat> so maybe, uh, yes, so I, I will start now with, with maybe the most clear and basic and simplified uh, definition of what Feynman was looking at, and this is Hamiltonian simulation. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I will define the, the object that essentially will be uh, will be the, the, the main object that I will look at in my talk. Uh, we have an Hamiltonian, which is an emission matrix, and we have time, which is a real variable, and then e to the minus iht is a unitary matrix. Okay, this is just uh, basic mathematics. <clears throat> uh, so if it is a unitary matrix, then why not implement it on a quantum computer? Okay, why that we will do that? It's not that uh, every time we see a unitary around, we are going to implement it on a quantum computer. Uh, uh, there are several reasons. First of all, there is the prime reason by, by Feynman, uh, just to simulate quantum systems. Uh, or as he said, because nature isn't classical, and if you want to make simulation of nature, you would better make it quantum mechanical. So this is uh, the, 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 the primary reason. But since uh, uh, this, uh, of course, quantum computing evolved and many quantum algorithms and applications uh, appeared, and actually Hamiltonian simulations, Hamiltonian simulation appears in many of them. So I named here a few, and I'll give some references at, uh, at my final slide. So first of all, uh, people use uh, quantum phase estimation to find ground state uh, of molecules. This uses Hamiltonian simulation. 
also for solving linear equations such as the HHL algorithm, for solving partial differential equations, for propagating uh, in continuous quantum works, and uh, as uh, Rolando said, uh, presented in, in, in the previous talk, uh, in simulating coupled classical oscillators. <clears throat> so the main point here is that uh, Hamiltonian simulation is, is, a, is a quantum primitive, and actually it underlies many of uh, the expected exponential speed up in, in, uh, in quantum algorithms compared to the classical ones. Okay, so this was for the motivation. Uh, now, how we are going to do this? Uh, this is not, not that easy. I mean, it's not completely straightforward. Um, first of all, the problem is really Hamiltonian dependent. I mean, you, you need to look at your Hamiltonian and understand how you want to implement uh, its evolution. And usually the evolution, I mean, the implementation is, is an approximated one. <clears throat> And I'm going to show you uh, two canonical ways to do this. One will be with product formulas and the other one will be with quantum singular value transform. <clears throat> and one comment, uh, a general comment throughout my talk, I will talk only about time independent Hamiltonians, meaning that this matrix H is, is constant. Of course, in physics, it can also uh, uh, depend on time, but uh, this is beyond the scope of what I will present. But most of the technique can be generalized uh, to treat time dependent. <clears throat> okay, I'll start with product formulas. Um, uh, there are many different product formulas. Uh, for example, you have the Suzuki Trotter formulas of the Q drift. Uh, in classic, you can find uh, Q drift and Suzuki Trotter. These are built in functions. And under this path, uh, under functions in the classic library, you can find notebooks that showed you that will show you how to use it. Uh, in my talk, I will focus only on the Suzuki Trotter. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm assuming that my Hamiltonian is is a matrix of size uh, two to the n times two to the n, and that Hamiltonian is given as the sum of Pauli strings. So any matrix can be written as a sum of uh, of Pauli strings. So what is a Pauli string? Uh, it is a tensor product of uh, N matrices, N Pauli matrices, uh, the two by two matrices. It can be the identity, the X matrix, the Pauli Y matrix, or the Pauli Z matrix. So the Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of, as a weighted sum of, this, uh, of these terms, uh, where alpha are just real coefficients. So you already uh, from Eden learned about Q mod. So this is, uh, for example, how I uh, just uh, describe, I mean, define an Hamiltonian in Q mod. Let's say I want this Hamiltonian, XX with a coefficient 0 0.1, IZ with coefficient 0 0.5, etc., etc. So we have a, a quantum struct, which is a Pauli term, and I'm having a list of Pauli terms. So you see the first one is XX with this coefficient, uh, and this is a definition of, of my Hamiltonian. This is, this is my object. <clears throat> now, if my Hamiltonian is just a single Pauli string, for example, let's say my Hamiltonian is pi times z, 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 x, x, then uh, there is an exact implementation, I mean, a gate level implementation of its uh, Hamiltonian simulation. This is how it looks like. You can see that uh, it is composed of a uh, CX gate and RZ gate, which with, with uh, uh, the time. So this is a parameterized uh, evolution. And you have the edge gates, uh, which are actually related to the, to the X. Okay, so this is exact. We, we know how to implement this on a quantum, I mean, as a quantum program. <clears throat> now, what about uh, the case where you have a sum of two Pauli strings? So uh, with matrices, uh, the exponent of the sum is not necessarily uh, the product of the exponents. Okay? So this equation does not hold unless the two matrices commute. So if, if P0 times P1 minus P1 times P0 is equal to zero, which means that they commute, uh, then, then you have inequality. But this is a very specific case. For example, here it is true, but I can replace Z by X 
over y and, 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 and it will not hold. Okay, so we cannot implement this as a product of, of these two unitaries. And this is one of the facts that essentially we resort to approximated implementations when we look at um, Hamiltonian dynamics. <clears throat> and one of the approximations is given by the Suzuki Trotter product formula. So what are these? Uh, the Suzuki Trotter formulas are, are, refers to a set of formulas. Um, each formula is an order O and a repetition R. Okay, so I'm going to, to uh, designate them like this. I mean, the Suzuki Trotter with order O, repetition R and time T, it tries to approximate this evolution. <clears throat> And of course, the idea is that when the repetition goes to infinity or when the order goes to infinity, uh, uh, you converge to the correct, uh, to, the, to the exact evolution. So how does the Suzuki Trotter of order one looks like? Uh, it is essentially just taking the product of the single Pauli exponents. Okay, so I, instead of the sum, I'm taking the product of a single term. This is, order one and repetition one. If I want order one and a repetition, so the idea with the re repetitions is that you partition time by some factor. So I partition time by R and then I'm repeating my formula R times. Okay, so here, this is uh, Suzuki Trotter uh, with time T over R and repeating it R times. Okay, so if you like, uh, I told you before that this equation does not hold, I mean, uh, uh, there is an inequality here in general. And the, the first order, uh, Suzuki Trotter says that, okay, let's approximate this by that. And if we go to higher order, so for example, order two, uh, you divide time by two, and then you take the terms from L to zero, and then the terms from zero to L. Um, <clears throat> and you can also define higher orders. Uh, which are two L, so you can define fourth order, sixth order, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and this is defined recursively. Um, so the 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 this the fourth order uh, comes from the second order, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, on purpose, I didn't write the, the full formula here. It's just, I mean, it, it's not that long, but I think it will not help too much. Uh, you can find it, for example, in this reference, and and if you really like, I mean, we can. Uh, I can I can send it, uh, but it is essentially uh, this order is defined from the previous order. And again, with repetition for each order, we have a repetition, uh, uh, so we can refine our approximation by taking higher and higher repetitions. <clears throat> okay, now uh, these are the formulas, but how I actually implement them. So first of all, uh, one thing to, to understand is that if, if I have an Hamiltonian and I'm looking at uh, this function, it's, it's approximation of some order and some repetition, there is an exponentially different ways to, to implement this uh, on, on, I mean, on, as a quantum program. I mean, there are exponentially different ways to decompose it uh, to six gates and to rotations. And classic has uh, Suzuki Trotter as a built-in function and this built-in function already provides you an optimized implementation, which reduces the CX count and the function depth. Okay, so this is, for example, how I would call a Suzuki Trotter with my Hamiltonian that is defined here. Uh, this is the evolution time T, and I'm doing order four and one repetition. Okay, so this is a built-in function, uh, and it is, as I said, it, it has compared to just, I mean, trying to, to write it yourself, uh, and choosing some different implementations, then uh, in our case, the six count will be reduced uh, by quite much. And again, under this under under this uh, this path, you can you can look at uh, more examples. Okay, so I told you that we have a formula that approximates our evolution, but I didn't say anything about how good the approximation is. Uh, I just said that higher order and higher repetition will give you better approximation. But of course, uh, usually you're interested in, in more precise uh, questions and answers. Uh, 
So let's say I want uh, an epsilon approximation. Uh, and then I ask, I mean, an epsilon approximation for my Hamiltonian dynamics. And then I ask, which, which formula should I choose? Uh, now, this is not that, I mean, not an easy uh, question. Uh, there are several papers that treated this question. And in particular, uh, the literature, what people give in the literature are theoretical bounds for the errors of these product formulas. For example, you can look at the distance between uh, Suzuki trotter uh, with repetition R and order, sorry, order one and R repetitions and ask how far is it from the real evolution. And here, here is a bound from the literature uh, and you see that it relates to, it goes as T square is one over R, meaning you can see that as R goes to infinity, indeed, uh, my arrow gets smaller and smaller. And this bound is actually good because it takes into account also the commutation relation. So this is your run over all the commutation relation between the different terms in your Hamiltonian, the different Pauli strings. And you can see that if, if your Hamiltonian consists only of, of uh, commuting elements, then the bound is zero and, and your formula is exact. <clears throat> so again, I choose not to, to, to really go to the mathematical definitions. Uh, you can find it there. In this last paper from 2021, I think it has uh, it provides the best uh, best bounds that 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 are known, and it also gives uh, not only for Suzuki trotter, I think also for Q drift, but uh, yeah, I think also for Q drift. Um, so you can find it there if you want to read more, also for higher orders. But again, this is not. I mean, you need to really define it mathematically, and I didn't go into the details, but usually uh, you can ask what is this? What is this? distances and people usually look at, at the diamond norm, which is uh, a norm for quantum channels. Okay. Um, so this was for the, for the product formulas. I will go back uh, to it in the end when I will present maybe say a few words about QDrift maybe. Uh, and now I want to move to the other de technique. Um, which will be based on QSVT. And it is related to block encoding based in approximations. <clears throat> in this path, you can see a notebook, uh, uh, Hamiltonian simulation with block encoding, and there you can see an implementation of these two techniques. I will focus only on the QSVT one. <clears throat> okay, so I, I will assume not no, no previous knowledge on block encoding. So actually this part of my talk will be a crash course on, on block encoding. And, and I, so I'm going to, to show, I mean, three, three points that eventually will help me to build the algorithm. So you will see it will be very hierarchical and I will try to explain each and every step. And eventually we will tailor everything to, to, to Hamiltonian dynamics. <clears throat> so this is a definition. Um, I have my Hamiltonian matrix, which is 2n by 2n, and an S capital M block encoding of this matrix refers to a, a unitary matrix that looks like this. Okay, this is how I, I, uh, I designate it. This is a block encoding SM of H. It is a bigger matrix where on this diagonal we have H, uh, which is 2n by 2n, and I, let's say I completed it to be unitary with a, a, another 2 to the M dimension. Okay, and this matrix is unitary, and S is the this factor. Okay, so this is the first thing. Um, and the idea is that if I apply uh, this unitary on some psi zero, then uh, on this part of the vector I get, I have H psi. If you write it with bracket, what you will find is that if you apply it on psi, so psi is of size n, and these are these quantum variables of size m. So if I apply it on this, uh, then uh, the zero part will be coupled to h times psi with some garbage. Or maybe let me show you like this. Let's say I have a, my block encoding function, which is some block encoding. Okay, so it's a black box. It has two variables. It has one variable uh, for the data for this for this part and 
one variable for the block, which completes it to be unitary. Okay, so my block encoding here, this is my block encoding. The data part is of size two, meaning the Hamiltonian is of size two to the power of two to the power of two. And I have a block variable, okay, which is of size three. Uh, so I allocate the block encode the block variable of three. Let's say I have some amplitudes that I'm loading to the data. So this is I'm preparing some C. Then I'm applying my block encoding. So C uh connects to the to the data part and the block uh, starts with zero. So what the block encoding gives you is that if you post select uh, uh, the block variable of size M to be zero, then you know that this state is uh, proportional to H times psi. Okay, this is, uh, this is the idea of block encoding. <clears throat> now for the second point. Um, let's have several block encoding unitaries. So I have a block encoding of A1, block encoding of A2, etc., etc. Then what we can do, we can block encode a weighted sum of A1, A2, and until AK. This is what is called linear combination of unitaries, or uh, which uh, are related to LCU, or prepare and select. Okay, the idea is that I know how, to, if I know how to block encode these, I know how to block encode a weighted sum of alpha of AK. Um, and again, you can see the size of the block, I called it M bar, you can see how it is related to the, to the problem, and beta bar now, the, 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 the normalization coefficient uh, is actually depends just on, on the sum of the, of the beta case. So this is the second thing to know that I know how to encode, to block encode um, weighted sum of unitaries. This is typically how it looks like. Uh, let's say I have A0, A1, and A2. I mean, I know how to block encode them. So this is block encoding of A0, and this is of A2. And so typically what you do, this is the prepare and select. You, you are preparing uh, amplitudes with beta. So beta over beta bar is a normalized vector. So you prepare the betas, then you're doing the select. So you are selecting the first unitary uh, controlled of uh, the prepare being zero. Then uh, the, sec the, the first one, I mean, one of being one and two, if the, uh, uh, this variable is equal to, and then you do the inverse preparation. Okay, so this thing, this is how you, this is the LCU, this is how you can encode um, a, a weighted sum. <clears throat> so now we will, I will show you how to do this uh, in QMOD. Let's say, again, I have black boxes. I have two block encoding, one of A1 with a block size of size of three qubits and a block encoding of A2 with a block size of, uh, of size two. And I want to block encode the weighted sum. So uh, again, I need to prepare the amplitudes of these betas, which is half half. The way to prepare the amplitudes is just with the age gate. Okay, so I have one variable for the betas for the prepare, and I need to do uh, within apply, right? Within age, apply something. This is what you see here. Uh, uh, prepare an, an inverse of prepare. Oops. So I'm doing within apply age. And then I apply if uh, the block, if if this block LCU is equal to zero, then I'm applying my first block encoding. And if it is equal one, I'm applying my second block encoding. And you can see one block encoding is with M equal three, the other one is with M equal two. So uh, for the first one, I'm using all the, I mean, the slice between zero to three. And in the second one, I'm using between zero to two. And, and what eventually do I get in the end? Uh, if I post select on the block, on the original block, and on, on the new added block, uh, I will I, I know that uh, here the state is coupled to A1 plus A2 times Psi. Okay, uh, and of course, I mean, in classic, uh, sometimes some functions uses auxiliaries and, and you don't need to care about this. I mean, this is this is done automatically. Okay, and now for the third part, the quantum singular value transform. This is essentially a quantum primitive that implements 
block encoded polynomial of a matrix. What do I mean by that? Let's say I have a block encoding of size n. I mean, my age is uh, 2 to the n, and my block size is m. Then the QSV technique uh, gives you a block encoding of some polynomial of h. Okay, what is the characteristic of this block encoding? It adds uh, one more one, one more qubit to the block size. So now the block size is m plus one. And okay, you have also uh, may, might have another factor as prime. And, and, and p is a polynomial with a given parity. So this is one of the things that QSVT gives you. <clears throat> and uh, this is how typically this looks like, a QSVT. So if I have a polynomial p of x, to apply QSVT, what you need to do is to first calculate some rotation angles, I mean, classical rotation angles that uh, uh, will be entered into the QSVT routine. Uh, these are the angles that are related to uh, the quantum singular, uh, the quantum uh, signal processing, uh, and you can do it with a with an external library, a uh, PyQSP, for example. So you want to implement your your polynomial. Uh, you say which polynomial you want, then you get the angles, and then the QSVT essentially uh, is a is a is a series of applying your block encoding, and a rotated reflections. So it is block encoding, rotated reflection, block encoding, rotated reflection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the reflections are uh, the rotation angles are the angles that you calculated from the beginning. So essentially, you have two to the n rotations if you want the polynomial of degree n. Okay, and again, you don't have to to worry about constructing it yourself. We have in our open library, we have a QSVT function. Again, under functions, under QMod library reference, classic open library, you have a notebook. And in this notebook, you will see how to call this function. And we also have two algorithms that are calling this function. One is uh, to find the fixed point, and the other one is for applying a, a matrix inversion. But, and again, I want to uh, emphasize that essentially this is a block encoding. I, I, have, I have my initial block encoding, a function and I, I plug it into a QSVT and this gives me a new block encoding with another qubit, with another block qubit. And I know that the data uh, will hold my polynomial times psi uh, times uh, when I post select of, B, of the others being zero. Okay, and again, this psi is something that I started in the beginning on the data, on the data variable. Yes, okay, so that's it. Uh, we are all set to approximate our Hamilton dynamics. Let's see how, how we are going to do this. So first you need to block encode the Hamiltonian. Uh, until now, I didn't say how to do this uh, because there are many techniques to do this and this is uh, just a block, one block in the algorithm that you can, uh, which is flexible. You can choose how to block encode your Hamiltonian. I will show it uh, soon. I mean, I will show one way soon, one way to do this. Uh, soon. And so assume that you have your block encoding Hamiltonian. Uh, the second thing you need to do is to uh, find the QSVT angles for approximating the polynomials cos xt times s and sine xt times s up to some desired precision epsilon. Okay, uh, you can approximate this by, by polynomials such as the Chebyshev polynomial. Okay, so once you have your angles, you apply QSVT to get the block encoding of cos HT and the block encoding of IS, I sine HT. Okay, <clears throat> I added to the notation here epsilon. Uh, epsilon is because this block encoding is not exact, right? I'm, I'm having a polynomial which approximate this and approximate that. Uh, uh, so I have you one and one, which is the, the factor and M plus one, is again, I'm adding one block qubit uh, to my block encoding dimension. So I have these two, and now I can do LCU to get the sum of these, okay? Now I can do LCU and get the weighted sum of these two things, which is e to the iht divided by two. Okay, so now I have an approximated block encoding of my Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, it has a 
a pre factor of two, this is this f, and m plus two is the dimension of, of my block. Okay, this is how it looks like. Uh, I have a QSVT for the cosine, I have QSVT to, to i times sine, and then I'm doing exactly what I showed you before. I'm doing LCU, I'm doing a block encoding of the sum of these. Okay, so if, if this variable is equal to zero, I'm applying the, this QSVT, otherwise I'm applying this one. And if I post select on, on the other qubits being zero, I know that here I have uh, an approximation of e to the i h t. So this is how you apply a maintenance simulation with QSVT. Um, so it is important to know that the, the, the depth is dictated essentially by the, num by the number of rotations that you, that you apply with the QSVT, which in turn depends on epsilon. Or, or the other way around, usually you say, okay, I want an epsilon approximation. I will generate uh, a polynomial for sine and cosine according to this approximation. And this, this will tell me how many angles I need to, to have. Okay, one slide about block encoding Hamiltonians. Uh, one way to block encode Hamiltonians is actually with LCU. So if your Hamiltonian is given as a sum of Pauli strings like this, so you can block encode it with the prepare and select. What you can do, you can do prepare this alpha. So you can, you, I have you four alphas, so I need two qubits. Okay, so I prepare a state which is alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. And then I'm doing the select. So the idea is that i, 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 z, x, x, and z, z, they are all unitaries. So I'm doing this unitary, then that unitary, et cetera, et cetera, all controlled on this state. Then I'm doing the inverse. And actually this is the block encoding of my Hamiltonian. But of course, depending how how I'm, if your Hamiltonian is sparse in in the in the in the in the elementary basis, maybe you want to block encode it differently. So for a given Hamiltonian, uh, you need to think how you want to block encode it. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, I hope I convinced you at least in the beginning that Hamiltonian simulation is a quantum primitive that appears in many quantum algorithms and applications. There are many ways. To implement it, and all of them are essentially approximated. Um, I showed you in detail the two, I think, the most common ways to implement Hamiltonian simulation, which is Suzuki Trotter and QSVT. Of course, there are others. One is QDrift, which is essentially a random product formula. So instead of taking the, the, the deterministic Suzuki Trotter, you're doing something which is random. Uh, we have it in our core library. Uh, this is the original paper. Uh, since then, people worked on combination of QDrift and, and Suzuki Trotter. So some, some part of Hamiltonian you're doing with QDrift, some part you're doing with Suzuki Trotter. And in this paper, they also calculate the, the error of this. Um, and there is also cubitization uh, that uh, you can see in our notebook. It is, uh, it's maybe less efficient, but I think educational, it's a, it's a, it's a very good one. And it might be efficient in some in some in some cases, I believe. Um, and finally, there is also Taylor series. Uh, you can find it in this paper, uh, which is also, I mean, also a technique. I think less common, but still technique that probably is good in in some cases. And as I promised, here is references to to some some quantum applications and algorithms that, that include Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, before the, the detailed ones, in general, I think this is this is one survey of applications and end-to-end -end -end complexities of quantum algorithms. And there, I think it would be easy to navigate to see which algorithms are using Hamiltonian dynamics in which of the algorithms that the, the Hamiltonian dynamics is the crucial part. So it's I think it's a good survey and very and very easy to navigate in. So this is in general for quantum algorithms, but for Hamiltonian simulation, uh, in continuous quantum work, uh, you have this paper, you have in solving PDEs, such as solving the Poisson equation, uh, finding a ground center of Hamiltonian, and uh, also the, the last talk about simulating coupled classical oscillators. And that's it, I finished, thank you.